studying the book of First Kings. And uh, we're going to, you know, sometimes I'll rush through a chapter. We're not going to rush through this chapter. It might take us a couple weeks because it is so relevant and pertinent when spiritually applied to the present hour in which we live. Uh, we will look at historically, uh, obviously, what, what happened, but we will definitely see the shadows falling on our time. As you remember in the 12th chapter, what we saw was the kingdom uh, divided, uh, and the northern tribes uh, went away from uh, Jerusalem. Ten of them went north. They called themselves Israel. Uh, they uh, elected themselves a king by the name of uh, Jeroboam. And we saw at the end of the 12th chapter how this man, uh, Jeroboam, uh, built these uh, golden calves. He had, Jeroboam had spent some time in Egypt. And we saw that uh, Apis is the uh, bull that they worshipped in Egypt. And he got some idea for Egyptian worship. He set one up in Dan in the north. He put one in Bethel in the kind of the middle southern area of the nation. And uh, he made, a, uh, it says in verse 31 of chapter 12, he made a house of high places. And when God had ordained, his house would be in Jerusalem. He made priests of the lowest of the people, which were not of the sons of Levi. And here he's setting up a, a religion, devising a religion after his own thoughts and his own heart, even though he's using the name of uh, the Lord. And he built this altar and he made up this own feast day. At the end of verse 33, he, he ordained, uh, uh, devised his own heart and ordained a feast unto the children of Israel as opposed to a feast unto the Lord. And one of the things about religion, if you, you pay attention to it, because this is, this is like religion. Uh, God is not the author of religion. God is the author of salvation. And, and here's religion. Men love religion. The Bible says men, uh, four or five times the word religion is found in the Bible. It's found in a negative context. God is not big on religion. Men are big on religion. That's why there are so many religions around the world. And, and, uh, and men devise a religion kind of in their own heart, uh, their own ideas as to what's to be done. And uh, God is not pleased with that. God, in the book of Exodus, showed the folks a way out, a way out of bondage. Exodus, uh, an exit from the bondage of sin and service to, to the Satan in this world. God gave them a way out in Exodus. And then, and that was God reaching down to them. And then he taught them how to approach him in the book of Leviticus. And so after delivering them, he then showed them how they are to worship. Worship must be ordained of God. It must be God's way. It cannot be our way, even if we do it in his name. Modern Christianity is about worshiping God, worshiping God the way they want to worship God. And so a Jeroboam is a forerunner of modern religion in the name of God, if you will. But you remember, the Bible says God has magnified his word above his name. And so therefore, the only way we know how to worship in his name is according to the word of God. So Jeroboam, they're doing their own thing and uh, they're worshiping in their own feast days. It's about them. Religion usually is about us. It's about the flesh. Yeah, we use God's name, but ultimately it's about us. But worship is about God and about his son. And there is a difference. There's a, there's a huge difference. So, so here is this stuff going on. And in the 13th chapter, and behold, there came a man of God out of Judah by the word of the Lord unto Bethel. And Jeroboam uh, stood by the altar to burn incense. And he, this would be the man of God, cried against the altar in the word of the Lord and said, O altar, altar, thus saith the Lord, behold, a child shall be born unto the house of David, Josiah by name, and upon thee shall he offer the priests of the high places that burn incense upon thee, and men's bones shall be burnt upon thee. And he gave a sign the same day, saying, This is the sign which the Lord hath spoken. Behold, the altar shall be rent, and the ashes that are upon it shall be poured out. And so what we're going to see is the 13th chapter 
is a prophecy of God's judgment. And in this prophecy of God's judgment, God is going to work through a man. That's his prophet. And what we're going to see in this particular chapter, it break down into three portions. The first uh, uh, verses, maybe 1 through 11, will be the prophet's commission, his calling, and his constancy. But things aren't going to work out so well as we get later on. We'll see the prophet's confusion and compromise, and it'll end with the prophet's calamity. And uh, that'll be the conclusion of his life. And this is a chapter that we're going to take some time exploring because it speaks to what's going on in the church of Jesus Christ, just as this went on in the nation of Israel. Now, now the first thing that happens is, uh, behold, there came a man of God. And what we're going to see is the pattern throughout the scriptures is God is going to work through men. Now, the greatest work he did was through a man named Jesus Christ. Behold, there's one God and there's one mediator between God and men, and that's the man, Christ Jesus. God works through men, but God has ordained just as Jesus Christ was the God man. God is going to use men to do his work, even to write this book, which is a God man book. The spirit of God through the hands of men that were uh, submitted and consecrated to God. And before he wrote, he had prophets speak. First came the speaking prophets, then came the writing prophets. And, and here's one of the speaking prophets. Now, he's referred to as a man of God. Now, this is a phrase that you will find in the Scriptures. You'll find it referring to uh, Samuel, the prophet. You'll find it referring to Moses. You'll find it in reference to David and to, to Jeremiah, and, and uh, the men of God. Now, the men of, this man of God came out of Judah. Men of God come from the right place. They come from the place God is working with. Now, the tribe of Judah is the one that, from which sprang forth the Lord Jesus Christ. And today, any man of God is going to spring forth from the spiritual loins of the one that came from Judah. That's Jesus Christ. There can be no man of God that is not of the generation of Jesus Christ. Generos is what is birthed. There's only two generations in the Bible. The generations of Adam and the generation of Jesus Christ. And if you're one of the generations of Adam and you are still in your natural man, you cannot be a man of God. In order to be a man of God, you must be regenerated by Jesus Christ. You must be born of Jesus Christ, born of God through faith in Jesus Christ. And so that's the first thing. You want to be a man of God? You're going to come from the right seed. But not only that, behold, there came a man of God. Behold, in every generation, God's going to raise up men to speak his word. God will never leave himself without a witness. He never has and he never will. All the way through to the end of this age, which is the church age, going into the next age, which will be the tribulation, there will be men speaking the word of God. There are 144,000 that will be raised up along with two other witnesses, men of God that will be preaching, notice what they preach, the word of the Lord. You can't be a man of God. There are two requirements. Number one, you must be born again. Number two, you must have the word of the Lord. You say, everybody's got that. No, most people don't. First off, the world doesn't. I quoted to you before that there's one mediator between God and men. And in that passage, it says, this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior. Maybe you want to look at it. I just want to show you how often God uses an ABAB form in his work. Go to, go to 1 Timothy chapter 2. And, and Timothy is going to become a man of God under the instruction of Paul, who personally was instructed by Jesus Christ. And, and God is going to pass the baton, no, pass the torch, the light, the lamp of truth from men down through men through the centuries. First Timothy chapter 2. 
of verse 3. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. Notice there was something good that would be A and acceptable that would be B. Verse 4, who will A, have all men to be saved. That's the good will of God. Behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy. It was good will of God that sent Jesus Christ into the world to give salvation to men. The good will of God is receiving salvation, who A, will have all men to be saved, and here's the conjunction, B, to come unto the knowledge of the truth. That's the acceptable will of God. Why? So that any offerings, any service you do will only be accepted if it's done according to truth. Truth trumps love. Past hundred years we hear about the love of God, the love of God, the love of God. Read Second John, read First John, read Third John, read this book over and over. Truth trumps love. I don't know how to love except according to truth. And God doesn't want you to come unto the love of God. He wants you to come unto a knowledge of the truth. Because salvation comes by hearing the word of God. There's no other way. So, so coming to a knowledge of the truth. How many saved people have come to a knowledge of the truth? I've been around Christianity 22 years. I've been to a lot of churches. I've been to mega churches. I've even been to a few giga churches. Because it's the next thing. I don't know what they'll have next. Terror churches. And that's probably what they are. They're tearing things apart. For the most part, those large churches are just a mess. And they don't have the truth. Because if you go, even if they have Bibles in the pews, and many of them don't, but if you go, it's not the Bible that was given by God. A man of God has the Word of God. A man of God knows which Word is God's. What language do you speak? You know which, which Bible is the right one for your language? I know there's a lot of counterfeits. Do you know what the right one is? In English, it would be the word of a king. It'd be the King James Bible, the old one from 1611. In, in Spanish, what is it, brother? You speak Spanish. What's the Bible for a Spanish-speaking person? The Reign of Valera. The 1602 and the latest would be the 1865. That's it. That's when God was working during the Philadelphian church age to give the Bible in his language. When we were over in Zimbabwe, the yeah, others modern counterfeit shown of Bibles. But thankfully, during the time of David Livingston, during the Philadelphian church age, there is a shown Bible that has the breath of God on it. God is faithful to give his book. We're talking with some of the, the folks from China. They got these modern Chinese Bibles, which are like NIVs. They're full of error. That's okay. There's a little truth in them. There's a lot of error in them. But you go back, there's an old Chinese Bible that has the truth in it. You get saved, A, be saved, B, you come to a knowledge of the truth. Very few do. Men of God come to a knowledge of the truth. Uh, 1 Timothy, you go to chapter 6. The man of God. There's a phrase found in the Old Testament many times referring to individuals. Here it's found in the New Testament only one time. And Paul is teaching this young man, Timothy. He's teaching him to, to be sanctified. He's teaching him to, to uh, give attendance to reading. He's teaching him to rightly divide the word of truth. He's teaching him that, that all the scripture is given by the inspiration of God and it's profitable for doctrine. That's the first thing scripture is profitable for is doctrine, a word removed in a lot of modern Bibles. Doctrine is the unchanged teaching from a master. God doesn't change. His words don't change. If your Bible's being updated every five years, it doesn't match the one in heaven. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. The one up there isn't going through rewrites and changes. There's no translation committees working on the Bible in heaven. And up there, you're going to find uh, uh, one Hebrew Bible, a half a Bible. You, it'd be the Masoretic text. Up there, when we get up there in the library of heaven, you'll find one Greek Bible. It'll be the Texas Receptus. You'll find one English Bible. It'll be your King James There'll be one Spanish Bible, be the Reign of Valera. There'll be one Shona Bible. There'll be one Italian Bible, the Diodati. And you'll find them up there. And they're settled. They're not changing. Now, now the man of God, here it is, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6, is told in, in uh, 
the sixth chapter, he really, he really gets into it about the doctrine of God and how important it is. And he says at the end of uh, verse 2, he says, These things teach and exhort. Men of God teach and men of God exhort. And that's what this man's going to do when we get back to our historical setting is what this man's going to do to the king. He's going to exhort the king. Verse 3, If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness. Notice they're wholesome words. I was listening right in here today, some mega pastor church on radio talking about the word, uh, how we're slaves of Christ. I'm thinking, where did you get that from? Where did you get the word slave in an English Bible? We're servants of Jesus Christ. We are not slaves. God does not condone slavery in any way, shape, or form. A slave is not a wholesome word. Service and servants are wholesome words. Where do, these, where do they come up with these things? I understand where it comes up from a monetary standpoint. They've got to make money. They've got to have a copyright. He'll, he'll, he'll touch on that later on in the verse. But, but a wholesome words and the doctrine which is according to godliness. One of the things about the doctrine in, in the King James Bible is it's a doctrine of godliness. It's called sound doctrine. Sound doctrine isn't just in the head, it's in the heart and it's in the life. That's what sound doctrine is. It, it causes a sound to ring out of you like when the ringing of a bell, which is what the priests used to wear on their, on their priestly garbs. They had pomegranates and bells. The pomegranate for the fruit and the bell because it made a sound. And a, and a real Christian makes a sound. And it ain't like the sound of breaking glass or a bull in a china shop. He makes the sound of ringing forth truth. That's what sound doctrine is. And it rings forth not only in his words, but in his manner of living. That's what sound doctrine is. And if you have someone that doesn't consent to those words, verse 4, he's proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strifes of words. That's been going on for about 150 years in Christianity. That's what Hebrew and Greek scholars do. They strive about words. Well, the Hebrew means this. The Greek means that. You don't know Hebrew or Greek and you don't know God. Because you don't know, need to know Hebrew or Greek to know God. How's that? Because God didn't commit the Scriptures to the scholars. He committed the Scriptures to the saints. And God doesn't choose the wise. He chooses the foolish things of this world to confound the wise guys at the seminaries. No, then, you know, strifes of words. They're, they're verse 5. They're perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds, destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness. One of the gains they like is money. Big churches like big money. Big scholars like big tenures and big money. Big translation committees and big uh, Bible printing companies that print these modern corrupt Bibles, they like money. There's money in Bibles. The best sellers every single year are Bibles. The, the New York Times won't even put Bibles on the list because it's so far above anything that, that any modern author writes. The Bible's off the list because every year they sell tens and hundreds of millions of Bibles around the world. And a modern author is happy if he gets one or two million of his sold. So it's not even fair. But these Bible companies know there's money in copywriting modern Bibles. And churches will buy them and, and naive Christians will buy them if we advertise them properly. So, so verse 10, about uh, uh, the love of money is the root of all evil. Verse 11, but thou, O man of God, flee these things. Flee the strife of words. Flee the doting of questions as where did it come from? If you don't know in your heart and your spirit where the Word of God came from, why don't you get on your knees and ask God and stop getting on the Internet and stop asking other Christians and stop asking pastors and stop asking me. Why don't you ask God? I guarantee you God will show you which book is His if you want to know. The issue is most Christians don't want to know. But the man of God does. And he wants to flee all that garbage. And man of God, flee these things and instead follow after verse 11 righteousness and godliness and faith and love 
and patience and meekness and fight the good fight of faith. That's what the man of God does. And get back to where we were. That, that man's got a battle on his hands now. Because here comes the man of God in 1 Kings chapter 13. <laughs> and he's approaching a king. He's going, to, he's going to exhort, reprove, and rebuke a king. And talk about boldness. The righteous, the man of God, follow after righteousness, are bold as a lion. Now here's a king doing something contrary to the word of God. And this man is going to stand up there and point the finger publicly in front of many witnesses and rebuke him and reprove him according to the word of God. That's bold. Okay, your, your professor calls you into his office. Your boss calls you into the office. And you know that professor, that boss doing things contrary to the word of God. You want to stand up and rebuke him? You want to reprove him? And that's just the boss. We're talking about a king, a king that has the ability to say to the guards, off with his head. The man of God is bold. Because the man of God doesn't fear man, he fears God. And the fear of man bringeth a snare, but whoso putteth his confidence and trust in the Lord shall be safe. Safety is of the Lord. And so, so he, he comes right to Bethel, right to the place of public worship, where this king is trying to show off to the people, what a good godly man am I. Like the little guy that Jack Horner sat in the corner Stuck his thumb in the plum and put it out. And what a good little boy am I. Everybody thinks they're so good. Every man will proclaim and show off his own goodness. But a faithful man who can find. And he cried against the altar. Verse 2. That doesn't mean he's weeping. Here's what he's doing. Go to Isaiah 58. This is like a town crier. This some someone lifting up his voice and speaking from the diaphragm in a manner whereby many will hear what is being said. In the book of Isaiah, uh, chapter 58, Thus saith the high and the lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy. He says at the end of uh, the last verse of the chapter before, 57, 21, there's no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. There was wickedness abounding. So here's what the, the, the man of God's supposed to do. Uh, 58, verse 1, cry aloud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet, and show my people their transgression, and the house of Jacob their sins. Now look, this is rough stuff, folks. And I want to tell you why it's rough. Because it's not aimed at the world. He didn't say show the world. He said show my people. My people. Why? Because it's a funny thing about God's people. After they get saved, they want to go their own way and expect God to follow them. They want to do what pleases them, not what pleases God. And all we, like sheep, not goats, not pigs, not dogs, we, like sheep, go astray. And it takes a man of God to preach and to say, you're out of bounds. You're not playing the game according to the rules. Therefore I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, young Timothy, who shall judge the quick and the dead. Yeah, the quick, that's, that's us, folks. Judgment begins at the house of God. One of the reasons we need the assembly, one of the reasons you need church, is because here the Word of God is going to go forth. Any person I put in this pulpit... What I have to learn is from practical experience and spending time with him and his testimony is that that person's a man of God out of the tribe of Judah, 
of the loins of Jesus Christ that's going to speak the word of God. Or I'm not going to let him in this pulpit. And so what you're going to hear is you're going to hear the word of God empowered by the spirit of God with, with the, the, the life force of the son of God speaking to the child of God. When the child of God needs some reproof for chastising, this is God's favorite way to chastise you. He'd much rather do it verbally than physically. And he's going to chastise his children. Therefore I charge thee, young Timothy, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead, preach the word. Be instant. In season and out of season. Reprove. Rebuke. Exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they'll not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust, they'll heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. You better remember everything I'm saying here because this is going to go on for a few weeks as we get through this chapter. And we're going to see what happens to this prophet as he compromises. And who ends up standing next to him during his time of compromise? Because compromisers will attract a crowd and the crowd likes the compromisers the crowd prefers the compromisers you want to build a big church compromise no doubt about it no doubt about it i could triple the size of this place i'm not going to folks this is all i have this is all you're going to get that this and some bad piano playing that's about it and you don't ever want me to cook because you're going to really get bad food. So I'm not going to do that to you. No food poisoning. Preach the word. Show my people their sins. I'm not going to personally do it. I'm going to let God take me through a chapter of the Bible. I'm going to put it out there and let God do his work. And that's why we need each other. So that we can hear these things. And the people that skip this they don't like a verbal tongue lashing. And so what happens is their life falls apart and then God's got to deal with them through the circumstances of life and he can be pretty rough. Be, be not deceived. God's not mocked. Whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. You want to sow to your flesh? You love the flesh, reap corruption. God can punish your body. He can't punish your soul, but boy, he can punish your body. A lot of people sickly and weak among us because the Lord's doing his job. He is faithful. He's a faithful creator and a faithful father. He'll do his job. Get back here. The man of God's got to do his job. He cried. He preached against the altar. How did he do it? Verse 2. In the word of the Lord. If you're going to do any preaching, young preacher boys out there, before you get worked up in your own spirit and you get worked up in your own ideas, you better make sure you're preaching the word of the Lord. What did he say? Thus saith the Lord. That's God's word. You won't find that in the modern Bible. You find that in God's Bible. Thus saith the Lord. I remember being at a mega church a number of years back with some modern bebop pastor with his blue jeans and, and just hopping and bopping around with all the drums behind him and the stage. It looked more like a rock concert than a house of God. Oh, we used to say, thus saith the Lord. We don't say that anymore. Yeah, and you're not a man of God. Because that's what the men of God say. Thus saith the Lord. That's what's said in the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord. Not brother Mike. I didn't die for your soul. I'm not keeping your soul. I couldn't redeem your soul. <laughs> I won't even say the rest. Look, But the Lord. He died for your soul. He shed his blood for your soul. And after he did that. He's got some instructions for you. There's, there's some clown out today. Uh, Andrew Farley, I think, is his name. Uh, and his brother, Chris, was probably a better comedian. But um, <laughs> this guy writes some comic book called The Naked Gospel. I'm going to take this thing apart with a Bible is what I'm going to do. And this guy, I called him on the phone one day. The, 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 these radio guys love him. Because all he talks about is the fact that once you're saved, God loves you. Once you're saved, God loves you. Once you're saved, God doesn't see any sin in you. 
And the, and the mistake he's making is not understanding the reality that salvation is a threefold work. The doctrine of salvation is the first step is justification. Where God, the judge in heaven, justifies the sinner in a moment's time and says, write that man's name in the Lamb's book of life. And that's wonderful. And that's, that's saving you from the penalty of sin. And I wish when God did that, He'd kill you. And I wish He killed me, and I wish He killed all Christians at the moment of salvation. But He doesn't. Because He leaves them around. Why? So that He can sanctify them. That's the long, difficult process of growing in grace and knowledge. And the only way that's going to happen is if you desire the sincere milk of the Word that you may grow thereby. Not a counterfeit uh, processed milk, powdered milk made from a translation committee where you add a little water and, and spit up and don't grow. Amen, Brother Mike. Yeah, I know. I've been in this for 22 years. Why don't you go to some of those churches with the other Bibles? See how grown up they are. Why don't you follow one of them for a week and see what they do? See what, how babies behave. No, you need to grow up with the Word of the Lord. That's a long, difficult process. So I called him on the phone and I said, you know, you're missing the whole purpose of God trying to grow a child from a baby to a young man to a father so they can be transformed into the likeness of Jesus Christ because they certainly weren't at the moment they got saved. The moment I got saved, I was 39 and a half and I had 39 and a half years of sin in me. And, and when I got up from that altar and walked away, I still had 39 years of mess inside my thinking, stinking thinking that need to be renewed by the Word of God. I still had bad philosophy in me that God needed to purge out. I didn't know how to behave. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know any of the teachings of the, the epistles of Ephesians and Thessalonians and Romans 12 through 16. All that good practical stuff that I needed to pack inside of me so that I could learn and build inside me the fruit of the Spirit. That's the Spirit of God, not mine. I was real good at my spirit. Just cut me off in traffic you'd have seen. But it's a big difference when the Holy Spirit gets in there. But it takes time. Sanctification is a work. It's a lifelong work. And this, the, this guy running the three-ring circus, Farley, is eliminating that and telling Christians, it's okay, go your way, have your fun. God loves you. God has a greater desire to make you holy. As a matter of fact, there's only one verse that says God is love. There's a whole bunch that says God is holy. God's desire is not your happiness, it's your holiness. And his love motivates him to get that in you and through you. That's his desire. Is to have people transformed in the image of his son. His son was the holy savior. The holy child of Israel. That's his son. So, when he cries against the altar in verse 2, he does it in the word of the Lord. He says, oh, altar, altar. Why? Why the double? Because there was one in Dan and there was one in Bethel. There were two of them. There, there were two altars. Oh, altar, altar, thus saith the Lord. And then according to the word of the Lord, he does something here. He makes a prophecy. Behold, a child shall be born unto the house of David, Josiah by name, and upon thee, shall he offer the priests of the high places that burn incense upon thee, and men's bones shall be burnt upon thee. And he makes a, an amazing prophecy here. There's two times in the Bible where God makes a prophecy about individuals other than his son. And he, and he calls them both by name. One is a Gentile king named Cyrus. And you remember that prophecy, it's, a, it's in the book of Isaiah, I think it's chapters uh, 44 and 45, where God mentions, there's this man Cyrus, I'm going to use this man and bring forth this man to release my nation from the Babylonian captivity. And he makes the prophecy of this man by name 170 years before he's born. And so one of the ways, you know, when you are trying to reason with someone that this is a God book. 
although men used their hands to write it, but God's Spirit was in it, is the fact that there's prophecy fulfilled. And they'll say, well, you show me one. Well, you show him Cyrus. That, that's pretty doggone specific. He names a guy 170 years before he's born. And when the guy comes along, born 170 years later, and then grows up, when he's a grown-up man, he does exactly what's in the book. <laughs> and he was a Gentile. He doesn't know the Bible. Pretty impressive. Now, here's another prophecy. Here he calls a man who's a Jew. He names this guy 340 years before he's born. It's King Josiah. He's going to be the 15th king of the southern kingdom of Judah. One of the really great kings. And this, this man going to come along and he's going to do exactly what God said he would do. You can read about it later on in the book of 2 Kings uh, chapter uh, 22. You'll read about this uh, young Josiah coming along. Really a terrific uh, king. One of my favorites. Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign. He reigned 31 years. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. And he, he led a national revival according to the book of the Lord from the temple. And, and he went out there and, and he renewed the covenant of the Lord and he destroyed all the idolatry in the land, including this uh, fake temple and fake altar that was built by Jeroboam. And so he makes this, this prophecy here. And the prophecy becomes fulfilled. But not only this, verse 3, he gave a sign the same day. This is the sign which the Lord hath spoken. And so to, to let these people know that, that this is the word of the Lord, he gave a sign. Now, now signs, you know, are for the Jewish people. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22. You, you should know that verse, particularly if you're one who is trying to defend the faith in a reasonable manner. Because you're going to see how this chapter plays all the way into our modern time. And eventually you're going to see the charismatic movement in, in, in shadow, foreshadowed in this chapter. And the charismatic movement is a modern crazy movement that wants to recreate signs and miracles and wonders in our time. And they're not for us. Because 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and remember, if you're a Christian, your doctrinal books are Romans to Philemon. Not Matthew, not Mark, not Luke, not even for the most part John. Doctrine begins in Romans and runs through Philemon. Not, not to say those other books, you can't learn examples in them. But from a doctrinal standpoint, the doctrinal books for the New Testament church were given to the apostle, to the Gentiles, which is Paul. And they're his epistles, all except the book of Hebrews, which God gave him special permission to write to the Jews. And so here we are in Corinthians. He's writing to a church. He's writing to, verse 2, the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. That would be us in Amherst. That would be people in China. That would be people in South America. Whoever has called themselves to be a Christian in the Lord Jesus Christ, here's some doctrine for them. And here's what he says. Verse 17, Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Our job is gospel preaching. Uh, verse 21, eh, eh, after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. God set it up that the world would have its own system of wisdom, and, and in its system of wisdom, it will not know God. But notice what it did. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. And I just want to help understand this because the modern Bibles trip this up and mess it up. They talk about preaching foolishness. We're not preaching foolishness. We're preaching God's gospel about His Son. It's glorious. It's not foolish. But the method God chose is kind of foolish. Just standing and, and crying out words is going to save a soul for eternity. No sacraments required. No works required. 
Not even a lot of intelligence required on our part because all we have to do is preach the cross of Jesus Christ. Could sum that up in a couple of verses. Let's see. All, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, was buried, was rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. And whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord and believe in their heart that God hath raised him from the dead shall be saved. It's a pretty simple message. Pretty simple. You get a seven-year-old to know that message. And a seven-year-old just running around saying it would seem foolish to a 60-year-old professor with a Ph.D., are you kidding me? You mean that's how people get saved? Yep. Yeah, God chose the foolishness, the simplicity of preaching. And it's got to be foolishness because he's got to save fools who believe there's no God. So he had to have a method that would get to the fools. And preaching is what he did. And that's all we're expected to do. Now go on to the verse 22. For the Jews require a sign. But we're not Jews. And the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we, that's the church of Jesus Christ, we're neither Jew nor Greek if we're in Christ. So we don't need signs, and we don't need a lot of wisdom of words. All we would need to do is preach Christ crucified. Jews require a sign. We don't. The church doesn't. But those Jews did. So God understands they need signs. By the way, what verse is that that says Jews require a sign? Verse 22. Verse 22. Why do you say that, Brother Mike? Because God likes to make things easy. If you go to the 14th chapter, which is about tongues and the charismatic movement, and you go to verse 22, and you can put the two 22s together from chapter 1 and chapter 14, wherefore tongues are for a sign which means they're for Jews. Which means every time in your Bible when you read a historical account in the book of Acts, which is not a doctrinal book. It's a historical book. And you don't get your doctrine out of history. But if you look at the historical book of Acts, every time someone's speaking in tongues, there are Jews around. Notice, because they require a sign. So God says, I'll give them a sign. Because there's Jews around. But notice, tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. Tongues are a sign for unbelieving Jews. Question. So why does any Christian church need to speak in tongues? Are, are Christian churches made up of unbelieving Jews? Are they not made up of so-called believing Christians, most of which are Gentiles? Then what the heck do they need tongues for? Well, they don't. And God's not doing it. <laughs> Don't you love a Bible? Doesn't it straighten these things out? We'll get, we'll get into this more next week when we find out more about this chapter. But get back to where we are. Where we were is God gave this speaking prophet a sign. Because he was in Israel speaking to Jews and they require a sign. It's a nation born under signs and we're talking about uh, 975 B.C. Long before the coming of Christ and the giving of the New Testament which is in your hands and there's no need for tongues anymore. I have to straighten these things out. I wish I didn't. But confusion abounds. Anyway, so he gives them a sign. Verse 4. So what's the response <laughs> of the preaching? He's done with his short message. It's a short, powerful message. The gospel is a short, powerful message. The Word of God doesn't need to be a long dissertation. It needs to be something very simple like, Repent ye. Repentance toward God. Turn back to God. Put your faith in Jesus Christ. Believe what the Scriptures say about the Son of God. Real simple, short, powerful messages. Doesn't take a long time. We were out on the street preaching last week, right, brother? We were preaching at a traffic light. How long is it, 30 seconds, 60 seconds? You'd be amazed what you can say in 30 or 60 seconds when you choose your words carefully. 
We do stoplight preaching. Now, look, I prefer open-air preaching where people are walking by and I have a little bit more time to reason with them. But you can get a lot out in 30 to 60 seconds. Probably didn't take them so long to say, O oh, altar, altar, thus saith the Lord, Behold, a child shall be born unto the house of David, Josiah by name, and upon thee shall he offer the priests of the high places that burn incense upon thee, and men's bones shall be burnt upon thee. And this is the sign which the Lord hath spoken. Behold, the altar shall be rent, and the ashes are upon it, shall be poured out. That's less than one red light. And he's done. Short message. Response. And it came to pass when King Jeroboam heard the saying of the man of God, which he had cried against the altar in Bethlehem, or Bethel, that he put forth his hand from the altar, saying, Lay hold on him. And here's, here's a truth that we'll see all through the Scriptures. When a religious man hears the preaching of God's Word, he's going to kick against it. He's going to respond against it. He's going to try and shut it down and shut it up. Now here's a government official. He just heard the preaching of the Word of God, and the first thing he want to do, stop that man and shut him up. And shut that down. And, and behind the scenes, the spiritual wickedness in high places of every government, from Peking to Moscow to London to Washington, D.C., and Tokyo, and any other one you want to name, and every one of those places, the, the, the driving force of those governments has shut down the men of God and the Word of God. Shut them down and shut them up. And right now, thankfully, God is restraining them. But in the not-too-distant future, a man is going to come to the front, the Antichrist, and he is going to set his forces out against the children of God and wage war against them. And there are places where that goes on today. But he, he's giving you the portrait right here. And, and it, I, I would imagine it would be very difficult to get into position of leadership if one stood for the Bible. There have been a few men that I've watched try. I guess the most recent one I've seen in the last 20 years is a man named Alan Keyes. You can go on YouTube and watch his debate. He ran against Barack Obama for the Senate in uh, Illinois. And, and every time uh, Keyes was asked a question, he would say, well, the Bible says, and he would try and answer from the Bible. And of course, Obama had nothing to do with the Word of God. And uh, basically at one point said, look, I'm not elected. I'm not trying to be elected preacher. I'm trying to be elected senator. And when the people had an opportunity to vote, it was 73 to 23 against uh, Keyes. Nobody wanted a man like that. Sadly, because men love darkness rather than light. And so God will judge America because the voters voted for what they wanted. They got what they deserved. And uh, they, they turned down a man of God. They turned on a man that said, I'm going to try and, and rule according to the Bible. We don't want that. And so I think the, my point being, even if you had a, a man that wanted the position, he probably couldn't get it. And the men in the position are men that don't want it, and they're going to want to shut it down. And in this country alone, which was founded by men at one point that at least had a Bible, in 1963 they decided no more Bible in the schools. No more Ten Commandments in the schools. No more prayer in the schools. Lay hold on that stuff and shut it down. And in 1967, you could carry a Playboy into a classroom, but not a Bible. Spiritual wickedness in high places. By the way, how's it working out? How's it been working out for America? Lay hold on him. And, and as he did this, verse 4, his hand which he put forth against him, that's the king's hand against the man of God's hand, his hand, the king's hand, dried up so that he could not pull it again to him. Now there's two types of leprosy. There's wet leprosy and dry leprosy. And it usually starts as a wet weeping form and then eventually it dries up. And, and here it's like he had a rapid progression to a, to a dry leprosy. And his hand dried up and he couldn't use it. And the, a leprosy attacks the uh, nerves. 
inside. Leprosy is a picture of sin. It, it's, a, it's actually a bacillus that works inside the nerves, and it gets in there, and at first you don't even know you have it. And then what happens is you begin to notice my feeling is a little bit off. And then what happens is because the feeling is off, sometimes when you're sleeping, and we have nerves that uh, when we're sleeping, it reminds us even when we're asleep, the nerve fires to the brain, too much pressure, need blood flow, roll over to other side, and we roll on our side. But when the nerves aren't working, continue to lay there and cut off the blood flow and get something caused ischemia, and then you get ulcers and wounds. And then all of a sudden, what was first not knowable to you, then knowable to you, now becomes known to others. And it's like the progression of sin. First, a little bit of sin is in you. You're not even sure of it. Then it starts to get a hold on you, but no one else needs to know because you're doing it alone. But then finally, it begins to press to the point where other people see it. And then it begins to weep. And then it's contagious. And then your sin's to the point where it bothers others. And then at a the point, everyone gets away from you and the thing dries up and you don't really infect anyone anymore because no one wants to get near you. And he got to the point where he rapidly progressed through to this dry area. Go to uh, Zechariah chapter 11 because this man is a portrait of someone. Zechariah 11. One of the great prophetical books in the Bible is Zechariah. In order to know Revelation, you, you got to need to know Zechariah. But then again, you don't need to know Revelation. You need to know Jesus. How's that? And Revelation will all work out for you one day when he comes back. So if you don't know it now, don't, don't frustrate yourself. Revelation 11. And, um, and here the Lord is uh, prophesying some things that are going to happen in the last days. And um, verse uh, 15, he talks about the Lord said unto me, Take unto thee the instruments of a foolish shepherd. For lo, I will raise up a shepherd in the land which shall not visit those that be cut off. Neither shall seek the young one, nor heal that is broken, nor feed that that standeth still. But he shall eat the flesh of the fat and tear their claws in pieces. Woe to the idle shepherd. Uh, this foolish shepherd's going to build an idol. And here's Jeroboam. He just built these two idols. And he's got these false altars. And, and, and a leader is a shepherd, folks. Now we think of a shepherd just as a religious leader, but God looks at, as a, at a community leader as a shepherd. And especially in Israel where the king was one of the three ordained offices. You've got the, the priest, you've got the prophet, and you've got the king. And they're all supposed to be working together. They're supposed to be working under the word of God. The king was supposed to write himself a copy of the law of God, it said in Deuteronomy 17. And here's this foolish shepherd king. That's ignoring the word of God and doing his own thing. And he says, this is a picture of the Antichrist though. But, but here you can even see how this Jeroboam is like a portrait of the Antichrist. Woe to this idle shepherd that leaveth the flock. And he just left most of the flock. The sword shall be upon his arm and upon his right eye. His arm shall be clean dried up. And there's a portrait of Jeroboam. He put his arm out and it was dried up with that dry leprosy. And leprosy is going to be one of the diseases that are going to pop back up during the uh, tribulation. It's going to be the plague of nations is leprosy. God's going to let it run rampant again. And they won't be able to fix it, dear doctor friend. <laughs> they'll be out of antibiotics. Modern medicine will be, they'll be back in the back ages, the stone age, when God brings his judgments down during the tribulation. <laughs> there'll be no cell phones during the trib. That's one of the reasons I want to live in the trib. No self. That's another story. But um, going back to where we are. So, so, so his, his arm dries up in 1 Kings chapter 4. Or 1 Kings chapter 13, verse 4. Notice chapter 13. The Antichrist appears in chapter 13 of the book of Revelation. Jeroboam's a type of the Antichrist. And notice also what happens in verse 5. And the altar was also rent, and the ashes poured out from the altar according to the sign which the man of God had given by the word of the Lord. And there was an instant partial fulfillment of the prophecy. 
The rest of the prophecy will be fulfilled 340 years later. But there was a near-term fulfillment. And one of the things God wants us to learn when we read the Bible and study prophecy is to understand the dual nature of prophecy. There's a near-term and a far-term. Why do you do that, Lord? Because the Bible is a dualistic book. There's an Old and a New Testament. There's God's hand in it. There's uh, the men of God, their hands in it. Jesus was both God and man. There's a dualistic nature. There was a first coming. There's a second coming. And so, so he wants us to, to pay attention. So, so he gives us a little markings like this to see. And here's the first portion of the prophecy fulfilled right, be, right before their eyes. That happened right away. They should have all repented. This is a man of God. This is a man of God that just spoke. But th they didn't. <laughs> they didn't. However, the, the king was interested, verse 6. Again, the man of God had given by the word of the Lord. Notice those phrases. Man of God connected to word of the Lord. Man of God connected to the word of the Lord. You want to be a man of God? You want to be a man of God? You better be connected to the word of the Lord. You better be connected to the word of the Lord. You better find out which Bible is yours and the language you speak. And if your second language is English, God bless you, get an old King James Bible and study it and read it and study it some more and read it some more and meditate on it and get to know that book. And let that word percolate. Let it, let it get into your ears, deep into your ears. Settle into your heart. Start to work into your life so that when you open your mouth, you speak as the oracles of God. And you're, those words are fitly framed on your tongue instead of idle words written by men. You don't need books by Christian authors. You need the books in the book written by God. And, and if you're not good at reading, get yourself a CD that has the words of the Lord. Blessed are they that readeth and hear the words of this prophecy. And start listening to it over and over and over. A man of God knows the word of the Lord. Not the word of a translation committee. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm stepping on your toes. But you wonder you'll meet my Lord and say the same thing to you. you. You know better. You can know. There's nobody that doesn't need to know which book is God's. There's only one God of the book and there's only one book of God. And you can know them both. And most people are happy just knowing one half. But the man of God knows the word of the Lord. And, and when this happened and his, his arm dried up, verse 6, the king answered and said to the man of God, Entreat now the face of the Lord thy God and, and pray for me that my hand would be restored me again. Now, now, he was in trouble. And he saw this man has power. This man preaches and things happen. And so, so instantly he, he turns and asks. He, he's humbled. God can humble a man. Now it's a shame if he has to do it through disease. But he'll do it. But the sad thing, the response of the man was, entreat the face of the Lord thy God and pray for me. Now, thy God, what about my God? Entreat the face of the Lord our God. Is not Jeroboam of one of the tribes of Israel? Is not he an Israelite? He's not an Israelite indeed. He's not an Israelite circumcised in the heart. He's only been circumcised in the flesh. He's got a distant relationship from the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he's asking someone else to do his praying for him. Now, now this is something you want to learn. When you're in covenant relationship with God, Nobody can pray better for you than you. You don't need a mediator other than Jesus Christ to pray for you. There's nobody that's any closer to God than you are at the time when you're in a humble and a contrite position like this. That's the time with a broken spirit and in contrition when God's going to hear. This man could have directly gone to God, but no, puts it off on someone else. 
He really doesn't want a close relationship with God. He was like the men of Israel at the foot of the mountain. Moses, you talk with the Lord. We don't want to hear anymore. We don't want to hear that voice anymore. Read Exodus chapter 20. Men are always seeking mediators and priests, and the great high priest and the mediator has been given to us. This was the king of Israel. He easily could have spoken to the Lord, but he didn't. And notice the man of God besought the Lord, and the king's hand was restored to him again, and it became as it was before. Now you would hope that something like that would have an... Uh, a lifelong impact on Jeroboam and he would change his ways. You're going to find out he doesn't change his ways. He's going to go right back to his evil ways. And what happens to men whose hearts are hard is even when they get a blessing from God, they quickly forget the blessing and go right back to their own way. But I notice the, the, the heart of the man of God, he returned good for evil. I mean, here this guy just told his guards to lock up the preacher, shut down the preacher, shut up the preacher. That's evil. And yet, when he said, please pray for me, the man of God quickly returned good for evil. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. This is one of the things that God does with his servants. The men of God are the servants of God. And they're clothed with not only the righteousness of God, but the humility that God gives as part of His robe of righteousness. And Paul in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 is, is saying um, to the Corinthians who are very childlike. But he, he's saying in here that... Uh, Verse 10, we're fools for Christ's sake because they preach a gospel. People think they're foolish preaching, but they do it. You know, people do think you're foolish when you're out there on the streets preaching. They, they think we're fools. But God's trying to reach them. They're the fools because they've denied the truth. We're fools for Christ's sake, but ye are wise. Yeah. We're, we're just preachers. You, you're apologists. You're apologetics. We, we use evangelism. We use preaching. You use apologetics. We are weak, but ye are strong. Yeah, I don't know Hebrew and Greek, but you guys got all your lexicons. Uh, ye are honorable, and we are despised. Even to this present hour, we both hunger and thirst, and are naked and are buffeted. We have no certain dwelling place, and we labor, working with our own hands. Being reviled, we bless. Here was a man that was just reviled for his labor. By the way, I found out who the name of that prophet was that, that spoke to Jeroboam. It's finally found in the book of Second Chronicles, and I, I can give it to you. Um, his name is Ido, I-D-D-O, which means power, strong. And um, Ido the prophet had just preached to Jeroboam. One of those things you've got to keep reading the book to find out who his name is. And here this man, Ido, and he just preached God's word, and, and he, was, he was reviled for preaching it. And yet as soon as the man that reviled him asked, as he'd just been slapped on the cheek, and we did right around as he turned and prayed for him. And what the Lord wants to teach us is, is, and this is very difficult, and we can only do this in the Spirit of the Lord, not in our own spirit, but when we are reviled for preaching, when we're mocked for preaching, when we're scorned and laughed at for preaching, if, if the very people that revile us, turn and ask a favor, we're to bless them. And that's exactly what the man of God did here. Because that's what the Lord, word of the Lord teaches. And that's what God's trying to work. That's how Jesus Christ was. Jesus Christ never got angry with anyone for what they did personally to him. Never. You could slap Jesus Christ. People did. You could pluck out his beard. People did. You could put a crown of thorns on his head. People did. And he prayed for them. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. We get angry when people upset us. Jesus never did. People, Jesus only got angry when somebody hurt women, hurt children, hurt the helpless. That angered him. You do anything you want to him. Didn't, didn't get his anger. Do you see the difference? 
That's how the Lord wants to teach us. That's how this man was. He'd just been reviled, and he turned right around and blessed. We're running out of time. There's a lot in this chapter. We're just beginning to get into it. There's so much that's going to happen, because the sad thing is, this man of God who starts out with a good commission, and he starts out consistent and strong, is going to meet another man of God who's going to compromise him and confuse him and lead him to a sad end. And uh, we're going to look at that over the next few weeks. Any questions on what we looked at tonight? Uh, yes, got a question here. Yes. I see, I see. Yes, this is a chart that was done a few years ago. It's a pretty good one. It has a list of all the kings of both the northern and the southern kingdom, the northern being Israel, the southern one being Judah. And if anybody would like, we can make a copy of this and you can have it. And you'll need a magnifying glass to get it. And you can talk to uh, Clouseau. Inspector Clouseau has a magnifying glass. And we'll, we'll get him. All right. Let's, let's pray. Lord, thank you uh, for uh, writing this chapter. This is, can be a rough chapter, but it's pertinent to the present hour. We don't have many men of God left. We don't have many men that follow the word of the Lord anymore. And uh, Lord, we need those men to stand and say, Thus saith the Lord, and to cry aloud and spare not, and to show thy people, your people, Lord, to show our sins. So help us in the fellowship so that you can do the work by the Spirit of God through the preaching of the Word of God to help heal us and strengthen us to use us, Lord, so that we can go out and not with words of wisdom, but just standing meekly and humbly through the foolishness of preaching, help save those out there, the Jeroboams out there that need salvation. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.